When we're talking about a saltwater refugium, the original definition was a place that an organism could take refuge. People used to put their bullied or injured fish down in the refugium so that they could rest in. Now we know that algae in itself can be a good indicator of the nutrient levels within the tank and be used as a tool in the export system of those excess nutrients. It also stabilizes the tank parameters via the reverse light cycle. It creates an area for increased copepod production and increases water volume of the system in general. The fuge can typically be found beneath the aquarium filling a portion of the sump with fast growing simple macros such as Catomorpha, Gracilaria, and Cholerpa. There are some talented and experienced overachievers like my buddy Walid who combine the benefits of filtering refugium algae with the beauty of display macros in one tank. But that is for a whole nother video. Like really, I think it's episode six. It's coming. How can we use algae to fight algae? It wouldn't make sense to me either if I hadn't seen it work with my own eyes. There are lots of different ways to do things, but this method has worked for me for many, many years. If you're a new aquarist or a seahorse owner, or even someone who just likes macros or wants to know how to fix an algae problem, you want simplicity. So this is as simple as it can get. The goal in any saltwater system is balance. The key to having things run successfully is creating and maintaining that balance. And the way to do this is by making sure that the import of nutrients is equal to the export of nutrients after the organisms have gotten what they need. Bottom line. In the ocean, they've got all these natural filters. There's this huge ecosystem and a life cycle, life chain, food, food webs, food chains, all of those wonderful words. Basically, they all boil down to everything working together to make the system continuously run smoothly. We don't have that benefit in our reef tanks, so we have to find extra ways to make sure that we're exporting all excess nutrients. The way that we go about this is different for different situations and different tanks. A lot of different factors like flow, uh, photo periods on the tank and on the refugium if you use one, spectrum, all sorts of things go into what method you choose to use. Everyone should be trying to limit the amount of extra nutrients within a tank by removing uneaten food, maybe rinsing food prior to using it or prior to feeding it, um, making sure that you have a skimmer running, make sure you have mechanical filtration like socks and floss and so on and so forth. So we're doing all of these things to export nutrients. If you're doing these things, if there's still nuisance algae within a system, that means that the export is just not good enough to take care of all of the excess nutrients. The algae actually grows in response to those nutrients and because they're there. Without them, they wouldn't grow. I am showing you a very simple, inexpensive, and very easy way to deal with this problem. All we are doing is growing algae in a separate location to take up all of those extra nutrients so that it does not grow on the display. That's it. And then the second step is the export of nutrients by trimming or harvesting the macro. The algae used in sums are just like the microalgae and the nuisance algae in the aquarium. The reason the refugium method works is because you're giving the same types of filtering algae that are growing as a nuisance in your display, you're giving them the correct photo period, the correct lighting spectrum, the correct um, amount of light and strength of light, and you're making them grow faster than the nuisance algae in the, in the display. As the algae in the refugium grows quickly and we harvest it, removing excess nutrients with that algae, Thank you.
it did not compete the display technology. There it is! <laughs> the display no longer has those excess nutrients that would allow nuisance algae to grow. It's really simple. We're starving them. We are starving nuisance algae. Algae in itself is an excellent way to actually test your system and know how high the nutrient level is. If your algae is growing really fast and well, you've got a lot of nutrients. I thought about going into a lot of details about phosphate and how it works and nutrients and organics. But the bottom line is that when we're testing our tank for phosphates, there's a good chance that we're not seeing the big picture because the test kits on the, available today only test for inorganic phosphate. There could still be organic phosphate locked up in rocks, in sand beds, so on and so forth. That phosphate is still affecting the tank and can still cause problems. We could literally have a tank that tests zero phosphate, zero nitrates, and yet there's nuisance action. And the people are scratching their heads and oh my god, what is going on? What's going on is there's phosphate you don't see. That's the bottom line. So the recommendation is to try to keep phosphates as low as possible based on testing and then understand that there still could be phosphates in the system and if you see nuisance algae that means that you've got excess nutrients, you've got excess phosphate that you're not able to test for, bound up in something and the only way to fix that problem is to grow something that'll take up the phosphate in the meantime. The other secret to my success, of course, is Miracle Mud. I know that there's a lot of people that don't care for it, but I'm guessing that they probably used it incorrectly. When I put it into my established reef tank, I did do it slowly. I added a little bit and a little bit more and gave it like a week in between in order to make sure that things were working properly. But I had absolutely no issues and it's run my tank water change free for years. Since I wasn't smart enough to uh, take myself putting the Miracle Mud into my system many years ago, um, we're going to take a look at a fellow YouTuber, Rico's Reef, as he shows us him putting Miracle Mud into his beautiful system. I know um, my palette has been using it for roughly about 20 years, 21 years, um, and swears by it. I'm back. It's actually an hour later. So as you can see, the first 10 pounds right here, I'm going to put some in here, and I'm actually going to put a bowl up in here. Now I just took out all this chato uh, that was in there, cut it way back. Um, anything on the miracle mud, so um, critters or anything growing, so this is straight dry. So I'm going to wet it, let it go real slow. And drop it. That's it. Now the bubbles are going to come out, obviously. Miracle Mud contains all of these trace minerals that are so good for the system that we wouldn't have otherwise. And it serves as another place to keep the excess nutrients. The key to Miracle Mud is of course replacing it and taking care of it, removing any detritus before it's allowed to build up. So using macroalgae in a refugium setting and using Miracle Mud under that macroalgae are tools to be used as part of the nutrient export of your system, of your excess nutrients. The key to using them correctly is to maintain them. That's true of almost anything. So if I'm letting uh, algae grow in my refugium and not trimming it, Mm, it's gonna reach a breaking point. Of course, it will. When I remove the Miracle Mud every two years to replace it, I am basically giving my system a jolt 
of all new minerals that it needs, trace minerals, and I'm removing a bunch of excess nutrients that were stored up within the miracle mold. It's, it's really quite genius. So you do have to harvest the algae and replace and replenish the miracle mud, but maintenance is part of almost any system. And you're talking about once or twice a year, or maybe once a week, harvesting the algae. I'm good with it. It works for me. This is a very easy, inexpensive, and pretty, at times, way to do this. on my SB makes sure that all coral get the perfect amount of light spectrum needed for photosynthesis. During photosynthesis, the zooxanthellae within the coral take up CO2 and give off oxygen. The algae in the sump is doing the reverse. When the reef light goes off for the night, the refugium light comes on, which makes the algae start photosynthesis. My tank always has something going through photosynthesis and oxygenating the water. The oxygen that is given off by the photosynthetic organisms during photosynthesis is greater than the, ox or the oxygen taken up during respiration. So what that means is, even though the organisms within my tank are taking up oxygen and giving off CO2 when the light is off, the algae in my refugium that's taking up CO2 and giving off oxygen is doing it better. So my tank always has oxygen that is needed for all of the life within my tank. Just like the refugium, the idea behind an algae scrubber is to outcompete nuisance algae in the display by growing algae in the sump on a roughed up mesh screen. The scrubber algae will take up all the nutrients from the tank, effectively starving any nuisance algae in the display and preventing any new from growing. Ronald made me an awesome algae scrubber with two screens. This is very cool because when I clean one of the screens weekly, I always have a second screen with algae still filtering. 
I have used this scrubber for so long that the original lights it came with no longer work. So I'm playing with different lighting to see which works best. But the basic recommendation is 3000K bulbs in the warm spectrum. The water from my tank comes straight into the lidded scrubber where it meets floss or filter pad on top of a drip tray. Under the drip tray, there's another type of drip tray, I guess you'd call it, that directs the water down onto the screens. Because I'm currently playing with different types of lighting, I have to determine which screen has grown the most algae in the past week and decide which one is going to be cleaned. Based on the brown and slimy green algae on this screen, I'm going to guess that this light is not working very well. The bright green hair algae is what we want to see. The brown or slimy green algae usually indicates either a new scrubber setup, the nutrients in the system are too high, or the lighting is not good enough. However, all algae filters, and even though this is not the algae I want, I don't want to be left with nothing. So I'm going to put one screen back and just clean the worst covered screen. The reason that we really don't want the slimy green or brown algae is because it doesn't grow as fast and it blocks the light from getting to the algae underneath it, which can cause the algae underneath to die, releasing the phosphates and nitrates within it. The one and only thing I do not like about algae scrubbers is having to clean the screen. Yuck! After scraping, I always rinse it under tap water to make sure no loose little pieces of algae come off and get into my display. And now I have a clean screen to put on the other side and hope that it will grow some green, bright green hair algae for me. One of the biggest mistakes that I made when I first started with the scrubber is I did not have my screens rough enough. These need to be seriously roughed up. The algae sticks to the roughness, the little jagged edges. So be sure to make sure that your screens are very, very rugged, ragged, <laughs> roughed up. Another important point that I'll make while we look at my rough screen <laughs> is that the screen, at least one of them, needs to be cleaned every seven days, no matter what. That's one of the biggest mistakes people make is not cleaning them weekly. If you have that slimy green algae, don't think that it's going to keep growing. You have to clean it off. Remember, it's blocking the light to algae beneath it. Same goes for the green, bright green hair algae. If it gets too thick, it's blocking light to algae underneath it. Clean your screen, at least one of them, every seven days. Time to put the clean screen back and hope some better lighting will grow us some pretty green hair algae. Speaking of lighting, your screen needs to be two inches per gallon and you need to make sure that your light can reach all of it. The light has to be within four inches of the screen to run efficiently. If you're using CFLs, you want one watt per gallon, or with LEDs, you want a minimum of 30 watts. Make sure you're using the 3000K lights. The flow rate over the screens should be at least 35 gallons per hour for every inch of screen, and that's per screen. So since I have two 12 inch screens, I would need at least 840 gallons per hour pouring down over it. I run a DCS 5000 on my tank, so I think I'm good. <laughs> Thank you. 
The screen that I put on top of the floss is specific to my algae scrubber. The lid that is goes over my scrubber is just connected by a bulkhead and I'm always worried that the floss will get caught up or clogged and make a catastrophe. So I put a little screen there just to make sure that water keeps a flowing at all times. And this is the part where I remind you that you still need a skimmer. I don't care how efficient or wonderful your filtration system is. If you are running a seahorse tank, you need a skimmer. Once upon a time, I stupidly added some macroalgae to my display tank without quarantining it. Not only did I end up with Calerpa covering all of my beautiful rare display macros and killing them, but I ended up with Aptasia. All efforts to kill the Aptasia led to more Aptasia. And so I ended up having to pull half of the rock, bleach and recycle it before adding it back to the tank. All the tank had during this period of time was the algae scrubber and skimmer. And you, I credit the algae scrubber with help from some bacteria completely for keeping ammonia at bay and my seahorses safe while I recycled half the rock. You can read a little bit more about my scrubber at wordpress.com. I'll link below. Macros can take a normal tank and turn it into a magical, wonderful, beautiful, colorful display. I just adore macro tanks. However, typically, the macros in a display tank are different from the types that you would use in a scrubber or in a refugium. In fact, trying to mix the faster growing nutrient export macroalgae, as I like to call it, with the rarer, more pretty, decorative display algae can be a big problem. The faster growing will outcompete the slower and you'll lose a lot of macro. So, we're going to do an entire video dedicated to placement, lighting, because it is different, and all of the separate needs of display macroalgae. I'm going to walk you through how to set one up and care for it and keep it happy. But this video is getting way too long, so we'll save the display tank macro discussion for another time. If this is what you want, a beautiful tank like this, Make sure to keep coming back for more videos. But I do want to say that I very much appreciate every single person that watches my videos and subscribes to this channel. You have absolutely no idea how much this means to me. I love making these videos and I'm going to start working on expanding into doing more of the, um, I don't want to say daily because I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to misquote myself, but I'm going to work on doing simpler videos that are more to the point so that people can get the information that they need. Because while I love making these videos, I definitely want to make sure I'm putting out videos that people want to watch. I want as much feedback as possible, so tell me what you think. Tell me what is confusing. Tell me what you want to hear more of. I didn't want to go in-depth into the phosphate um, information because, again, it's YouTube. I don't want you to click away just because I'm rambling. I tend to do that quite a bit on my own <laughs> without trying to explain something really complicated. So if you do want to know more about phosphate, let me know. I can, I can do another video or I can send you to people who know even more than me. I know, it's shocking. But there are, there are people out there. I actually learned a lot from talking to people at the reeftank.com. I promised that I would make clear that there are other ways to do things and that understanding phosphate and understanding how to limit phosphate within a system is especially important. Thanks for all of the stuff that you taught me. I, I learned stuff about phosphate that I did not know. 
I'm gonna still stick with my refugium. <laughs> Anyhow, thanks so much for watching. Please stay tuned. And that makes no sense, so I'm gonna start over. The other, those people who have zero phosphate testing on their test kits, yet still have nuisance algae, I would bet money that if they started up a refugium and ran it correctly after making sure everything else was correct, like their lighting and flow, I'm, I, I'm telling you, I would be totally shocked if starting a refugium did not fix it. It fixed the problem. From my friend, I forgot his name. Great.